Welcome to Alex G Square, everybody. Today I have an unboxing or a piece of equipment I've been wanting to get for the 1600 gallon system for quite some time. It took a little while after it got ordered to come in, but it was well worth the wait. I went and stopped by my local fish store, Reef Plus, and had a box which was already open because several of the items in it were for him as well as me, but I managed to sneak the box out. And that box, of course, has Apogee on it. That's right. If you're not familiar, Apogee is a company that makes PAR meters. And I've been wanting to get a PAR meter for the 1600 gallon system for quite some time. And I've been actually very nervous about turning my lights up all the way because I haven't had an effective way of measuring the actual light output of my radions. Let's jump right into this box, even though it was already opened up a bit. Now we got a, a little Apogee brochure. Also, there's a little card in here of everything you need to know to get started. Just quite nice, I've been to Apogee's website. I actually have uh, looked at quite a bit of stuff that they offer on there, so it's a very interesting website to check out if you wanna see what kind of Apogee products that you'd be interested in. Now, I got two things from Apogee. Uh, first, I went ahead and I got a wand to hold my PAR meter. I could have probably done a DIY for this, but I figured, you know, it's just gonna be a little easier to just purchase one of these. And I went ahead and I got this wand that holds the actual sensor for the PAR meter. Of course, the other thing in the box is the PAR meter itself. Now this is the SQ520 sensor from Apogee. This is the full spectrum sensor. And you'll notice there is no handheld meter here. This is a USB only sensor it hooks up to your computer they have software that you could download for free on windows and that's what i am choosing to use for my par meter and i have a couple of reasons for that one this is a tool that i do plan to use quite a bit and i want to experiment around with a lot there are a whole bunch of uses i have for this par meter and in part the usb gives me a couple of advantages one, I don't have to worry about the handheld meter and I could plug this directly into a computer. The software is very similar to how the PAR meter works on the handheld unit. There's just a limited amount of features, but the one that I do really like is that in the Apogee software when you download it, it could log your values and save them to a CSV file. And for some of the experiments and data that I'd like to collect for the 1600 gallon system, it's really gonna be useful to be able to log that data straight into a computer, not have to try and take it out of a handheld device, convert it over to a computer, and it's just gonna save me a little bit of work. The USB model is also a lot more cost effective because you don't have to purchase that handheld unit to go with it. And those two things really kind of sold me on going with this USB model. It does have a longer cable on it, which when I get into actually setting it up and using it, I want to show everyone exactly why that's going to be a nice advantage to be able to kind of set the computer off to the side a little bit, allow me to have the wand in the tank and, and work on logging PAR points within the 1600 gallon system. And this is where I really want to hear from everybody is, what do you want to see me do for measurements with the PAR meter. I'll definitely be going into the 720 gallon tank, the 480 gallon tank, and even the refuge tank. But I really want to know if there's something specific that you want to get a PAR value on. It's one thing that's always kind of difficult in this hobby is you can't judge light visually with your eyes the same way that a PAR meter works. Your eyes just don't work that way. And when you look at something that's in a person's tank and you ask what kind of lighting you have it under, it can be kind of difficult to really understand what that means. And that's precisely why I've not been turning up the intensity very high on my radions. I don't understand what that light intensity is to a certain degree. I know that I could probably get away with the 55% that I have on there now, which everything's been doing well for the last week and a half, two weeks. But if I want to start turning these lights up to much higher intensities, I really want to be careful that I don't burn any of my corals out by giving them too much light too quickly. And that's why a PAR meter is so important. 
But by all means, if you see a coral, such as like the bubble coral or any of the handful of little acro frags I have right now, you want to know what par I have them at, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I will try to get to measurements as soon as I can. Not only will I be doing a series of videos on this par meter, I'll give it a review as well after I get some actual usage out of it. But stay tuned, definitely more to come on this par meter. I'm looking forward to using it and I think it's going to be a great tool in helping me create a very beautiful and long lasting reef system. Another thing I picked up at the store today as well was a Neptune solenoid with quarter inch John Guest fittings. Uh, this one I'm not going to tell anyone why I purchased this. I'm going to let everybody guess and in a few weeks time I'll reveal what the use is for this solenoid valve on the Neptune. I look forward to hearing everybody's comments, suggestions, or ideas that they think I'm going to use it for. I think it'll be a little fun before I reveal what it's going to get used for. Other news that's been happening with the 1600 gallon system, I picked up some more sea urchins today. Now the algae in the 480 gallon tank has been kind of sitting stagnant. It's been growing ever so slowly in the patches where it is still adhered to the rocks. A lot of the rocks have actually kind of cleared off and I did go ahead and kind of go in manually today and just pull chunks of algae out of the tank and some of the algae is still got a really tight grip on the rocks and it's not letting go but there's other patches where it's simply just starting to fall away and that's telling me it's finally depleting all the nutrients it has there. The unfortunate part is though is that as it falls off the rock and dies it re-releases all those nutrients which means I have two options. One, I can either allow it to just continually go the way it is, which is probably going to wind up in a very slow mitigation of algae, or the other option is I take more active steps to remove the algae. And I think that's going to be the way to go at least somewhat. And I decided to not only do a little bit of manual removal of the algae, but I also stepped up the cleanup crew a little bit and I added four sea urchins to the tank today. I'll talk a little bit on the acclimation process that I do for these sea urchins, which is very similar to what I do for all my fish. I generally don't float my bags in the tank unless there really is a temperature difference. Literally, I go straight from the store, which is very close to my home, and I immediately get down in my basement, open the bags up, put them in a styrofoam, kind of prop them up, and then I will either dump out some of the water in the bag, depending on which there is, and then I add about a third water back from my tank and refill it. I repeat that process a total of three times, usually every 15 to 20 minutes. As the bag gets a little fuller, I'll dump out half to two thirds of that water and then continue to just add more back until the animal is acclimated fully. And most fish and most standard invertebrates, this is the process I follow. And once I have the sea urchins all acclimated and ready to go, one thing I will say is sometimes they're not the easiest of animals to get out of a bag, especially if you have something like a long spine sea urchin. You definitely don't want to just reach your hand in there and grab them. And the technique I generally use for sea urchins because they tend to tolerate a little bit of air exposure without much problem is I just tip the bag over, which I'm showing right here, and dump all the water out and then I simply dump them into a little specimen cup or any other kind of container generally is a good idea. If you want, if it's not a long spine, you could kind of grab them out with your hand and just put them straight in the tank, which is fine as well. Then I simply just pour them into the tank and try to set them out on some rocks if I can. Sometimes they don't want to let go of the specimen cup, which means you have to give a little intervention or kind of let it sit there and let them work themselves out. Once they get going in the tank though, generally the urchins might try to just go run and hide. Sometimes they'll sit in place and start eating away. In any case though, the sea urchins are a great addition to start eating the algae. And I bought three different kinds. I got a Halloween urchin, which is similar to a tuxedo urchin, a variety of a pink pincushion urchin, and then the two long spine sea urchins. They're all great additions. I will say, if you do like the looks of a Halloween urchin or some of the pincushion urchins, be cautious that they will pick up frags that are unattached or any kind of little pieces of rock or shell laying around and carry them around all dressed up for a night on the aquarium. 
Long spine sea urchins, on the other hand, won't pick things up. Uh, they will knock things over, which all urchins can do if it's something that's not glued down or, or epoxied down. But they generally don't harm any of your corals. And I think they kind of get a little bit of a bad rap just because they get so big. But they are great algae eaters. And as they get larger, if they become a bit of a, a nuisance in the 480 gallon tank, they're going to get moved to the 720. Because the one thing that they do have as an advantage over snails is that the wrasses will not try to eat them. Which is of course something that happens in my tank from time to time. I have the Melanaris wrasse, the Red Cigar wrasse, and the Checkerboard wrasse, which right now doesn't care about snails. But I can assure you when it gets larger, it will think that they are a nice little treat on the menu. Now most snails kind of wise up to these wrasses and learn that coming out during the day is not a good idea. But the ones that don't, well, sometimes they become a meal and sometimes they don't. But in either case, the sea urchins are in the tank. I'm going to continue to kind of monitor the algae problems. I have been testing my water and my nitrates are floating somewhere between 0 and 10 right now. And the phosphates aren't even reading on my test kit. I don't have an ultra low range. but judging from the fact that the algae really hasn't been doing anything in the 480 gallon and it's been losing ground slowly it tells me that it's pretty much burned up all the nutrients it had available with the extra lighting on the refuge tank too the algae growth in there has also stepped up which should start to help eliminate more of the nutrients out of the water that's what i want to talk about in today's video though i hope everybody enjoyed the video today if you did go ahead give me that thumbs up Wish to get more comments on the PAR meter or, or you'd like to guess what I'm going to use the selenite for, please leave those comments down below or any comments about the 1600 gallon system and for that. Of course, if you want to see more on the 1600 gallon system or any of the work that I've been doing on it, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thanks again for watching everybody and I will see you on the next video.